Good evening. My name is Kent Kleinman. I am the Dean of the College of Architecture, Art, and Planning. Welcome to the 2010 Frank H. T. Rhodes Professor uh, Lecture Series. For those of you who are not familiar with the Rhodes Class of 1956 professors, they were inaugurated, the, sister, the, the, um, the program was inaugurated in 2000 in honor of Cornell's ninth president to enrich the undergraduate experience by bringing individuals of great distinction to campus to interact with students across disciplines and colleges. The Rhodes professors hold three-year appointments and each year offer a university-wide lecture. We are here to hear the second lecture of the 2009 to 2011 Rhodes Professor, the eminent architect Peter Eisenman. If we had been a bit more organized, we would have divided Professor Eisenman's vitae into three chapters to be read as serial installments over the three years of his appointment. For there is simply no way to do justice in a single introduction to the impact or the output of this extraordinary architect without shortchanging some critically significant dimension of his vast accomplishments. Peter Eisenman is an architect, a teacher of architects, an architectural theorist, and an author of critical architectural texts, both written and built. And this last formulation is intentional and important. Before Peter Eisenman, one could not really claim that a built work was a critical text. It was Peter who insisted that architecture is never merely physical and always also semiological. A column, a floor, a wall is dull in the context of gravity, but immeasurably fascinating as a signifying element within an architectural syntax. Peter's bibliography is momentous in size and significance and includes over 45 years of groundbreaking texts. In the last half decade alone, his work has been the subject of over 15 books and catalogs, including in a very selective list, Peter Eisenman Architects, the Stadium for the Arizona Cardinals in 2009, 10 Canonical Buildings, 1950 to 2000 and 2008, Written into the Void, Selected Writings from 1999 to 2004 from, 19, from 2007, The Formal Basis of Modern Architecture from 2006, Holocaust Memorial in Berlin Monograph in 2005, Peter Eisenman, Inside Out, Selected Writings, 1963 to 1988 from 2004, and Giuseppe Terrani, Transformations, Decompositions, and Critiques from 2003. And that is a highly edited list. His realized buildings, his unbuilt projects, and his speculative design work never arrive quietly. They are much anticipated provo provoca provocations always staking out difficult and new architectural territory. A very highly selective list of Peter's projects include the landscape scale complex for the city of culture of Galicia, now nearing completion, the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin dating from 2005, the small but beautiful insertions into the garden of the Museum de Casa Vecchio in Verona of 2003, the controversial Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus, Ohio of 1989, the Honor Center for Design and Art in Cincinnati, the extraordinary project titled Moving Arrows and Other Errors of 1985, and the serial string of residential works from the mid-70s, including the masterful unbuilt House 10, or House Roman numeral X, or How Sex, or however you prefer to read it. Peter may elucidate us on that. Peter is very well decorated. He has received the Guggenheim Fellowship and the Arnold Brunner Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He is a member of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Letters. In 2001, he received the New York AIA Medal of Honor and the National Design Award in Architecture from the Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt Museum. In 2004, he was honored with the Golden Lion for Lifetime Achievement by the International Architectural Biennale, and just last month he was awarded the prestigious 2010 Wolf Prize in Architecture and Art. He has held faculty positions at, universities of, at the Universities of Cambridge, Princeton, Illinois, Ohio State, Harvard, the Cooper Union, and of course Cornell, from which he graduated in architecture with a BARC in 1956. He is currently the inaugural Charles Guathamie Professor of Architecture at Yale University. Despite a wide-ranging intellectual orbit, 
Professor Eisenman maintains a paper-like devotion to architecture and takes particular umbrage at those who would dilute the disciplinary primacy of architecture by conflating it with generic terms such as design. The thrust of Peter's lecture tonight is related in some subtle way to ongoing discussions at the college about what it might, what it might mean to call AAP a college of design. His lecture is titled, quote, Architecture or Design, Wither the Discipline, question mark, and that wither is spelt with only one H. Please help me welcome the inimitable Peter Eisenman. Thank you. Um, my longtime mentor uh, and erstwhile faculty member here, Colin Rowe, uh, said once that once you reach the age of 75, you're allowed to sit to lecture. Uh, given that prescription, and since I have done that, I am going to sit. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, since I am finicky about details, I want to correct uh, the dean uh, in that I was not the class of 56, but I was the class of 55. Uh, and, uh, you know, he must have me confused with Richard Meyer, but uh, he always does that, my cousin. Um, he would like me to think, or he would like you to think, that I am a provocation, but it, in fact, it is his provocation that has caused me uh, to defer from what I really wanted to talk about tonight to explain uh, why I disagree with him about changing the College of Architecture to a College of Design. First and foremost, why I don't like it is because there already is a College of Design at the University of the North and uh, to, to emulate those people, uh, just because their colors are the same as ours, I think is an, uh, you know, an enormous mistake. Uh, I would like to keep sanct uh, the sanctity of the term architecture for no other reason that it already uh, has been uh, mutilated at another university. Anyway, um, given that as a background, uh, you know, uh, when I was at Cornell, um, all of my friends, and myself included, were all people who didn't get into the University of the North, and uh, so we were here at Cornell. It was the school of second choice. And I imagine that much of the faculty, both then and now, uh, have the same problem, uh, that uh, uh, tenure was not available at the University of the North so that they are here. Um, so I would like to caution uh, anyone who thinks that uh, emulating that model would only uh, continue to provoke the stereotype. Uh, because I do believe, as, as Colin used to say, uh, the institutions that are guaranteed by guaranteeing institutions are often better than those institutions which supposedly, by which supposedly they are guaranteed. And of course, since I was at Cambridge, uh, which is a guaranteeing institution for Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, I can promise you that Cambridge is not as good as either of those institutions. And since I am now at one of those American guaranteeing institutions, I can also assure you that many of the institutions guaranteed, such as Cornell, uh, far surpassed those guaranteeing institutions. Uh, that is just by way of a prolegomena to uh, uh, what I want to talk about. Uh, tonight. There are two parts to my talk. One is, since uh, only very few of you are interested in the academic uh, notion of what would be the difference between architecture and design, um, you can uh, not listen to the first part of the talk because the second part I'm going to show pics of uh, a project, the, the, uh, <laughs> which is what architects are supposed to do, uh, of, of the Santiago project. Um, which, um, fortunately, I haven't showed here in Ithaca before. And um, what is very nice about it for me, I'm very excited, uh, is that the Pope is coming on November 6th of this year uh, to open uh, the project, So, uh, plus the King and Queen of Spain. And since I do find uh, 
popes and kings and queens uh, to be of my sensibility. Uh, uh, I'm, I, I would like to share with you what they're going to open. Uh, that having been said, I've got you all in a serious mood, I can tell. Um, um, I want to talk about uh, what is, in my opinion, the difference between the, the, the notion of design uh, and the notion of architecture. And um, I would say that one has to start out by saying, what is it that is architecture and what is it that is design? For me, and this is a, a probably a, a definitions that you will not find in Wikipedia, um, for me, design in its essence presumes to have an objective either an objective that has to do with a goal or an object, such as a program or a symbol, a structure or a context in the terms of architecture. Uh, um, but they are, these goals are in terms of architecture. That is, things we know or we think we know what architecture as a discipline is supposed to be. Uh, and in one sense, uh, architecture as a discipline differs from uh, its uh, related uh, uh, fraternal disciplines such as art, sculpture, uh, and uh, the other physical arts in that it has to shelter, it has to define a use, etc. So that um, design as an initial attitude is a way of resolving conflicts of many of the supposed goals of architecture, but it is not architecture, nor is it art. So design, therefore, initially has an objective, i.e. it is a strategy. And um, in one sense, it's a strategy. And in another sense, I would say it is the management of tactics towards an object strategy. So those are two possible ways of, of designing, of defining design. One as a strategy, and the other as a management of tactics toward an object strategy. For example, many of you who are architects realize that you're given a program in a studio, and you move toward a resolution of goals uh, toward the realization of that uh, program. Now, I want to shift that idea to the notion of the word discipline of which architecture is one. It is a discipline in the sense, and design is not. Design is cross-disciplinary. You can design structure, mechanical equipment, any number of categories have as a process design. That is the management of tactics toward the goal, uh, the resolution of, 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 as it were, difference. Design itself, therefore, is not a discipline. It is a subset of other disciplines. Now, architecture as a discipline is usually defined as a series of norms, that is, as classical architecture, Baroque architecture, etc. They are a series, any discipline is defined by what one is assumed to be a series of norms at any given moment in time. Uh, the notion of discipline, therefore, changes over time uh, and is defined as these norms change, which change from epistem to epistem, from paradigm to paradigm. My definition of, def of, of discipline, i.e. architecture in this particular case, is that at any moment in time, discipline is not only based on norms, but also, and more particularly, states of exception. That is a very important notion between the, the idea uh, that is implied, the goal-oriented idea implied in design. That in order to have states of exception, first of all, you have to have norms. And in order to move and change norms, there has to be within those norms the possibility of, of uncovering states of exception. My argument is that disciplinary, disciplinary activity, 
i.e. any process that is which includes the idea of design, um, uh, that is, as its process, but that the disciplinary activity is not necessarily defined by that process, such as architecture, sculpture, and painting, as opposed to design, is one in which the disciplinary exceptions are revealed through these processes. So that while design is a synthetic process revealing uh, a goal, um, architecture is revealed through uh, an analytic process uh, through the re revelation of states of exception. Through those things which confound the design process, which is always looking for goals and therefore for norms. All of architecture, therefore, that is the work of architecture, is analytic in the terms that I'm suggesting rather than synth synthetic. Whereas design is synthetic, architecture requires an analytic process. Uh, while all of each of these processes have to deal with program and shelter uh, as norms, the question is, within these norms, what is the possibility for exception? Uh, my argument would be that exceptions, that is the finding of these, which cannot be known at the beginning as a goal, that is, the goal is uh, uncovered as the process continues, is what someone like Jacques Derrida would call the undecidable, or which could also be called uh, uh, criticality. If something is to be critical, for me, it involves not the search for a goal, but rather the search for exceptions. That makes any discipline, uh, and that is architecture, as the nature of a discipline and design as an aspect of a search for a goal, two different discourses. Uh, not only uh, is design a subset of architecture, but as a discursive strategy, um, it, is, it is entirely opposed to what uh, a critical or uh, an undecidable architecture might be. <laughs> architecture, therefore, requires an analytic framework to understand the idea of exception. Our sex, uh, ex exceptions, for example, can be uh, a dialogue between modern and classical, between grammar and rhetoric, uh, any number of dialectical pairs uh, which no longer serve as goals but as ideas to be un uh, unraveled, let's say, revealed in their problematic state uh, and open to uh, a search for a possible exception within these determinants. In a design studio, for example, uh, the process uh, is always one of design, uh, a program and a site uh, find a synthesis. Um, that is, uh, assuming a set of norms. Whereas uh, for me, an architectural studio doesn't begin with a program or a site. It, it, it deconstructs any conditions of site and program to find those exceptions which lie potentially within any given conditions. It becomes an analytic process as a continual unraveling of given conditions as opposed to design. <clears throat> and if one is, uh, understands the uh, work that um, I have been carrying on for a long time, um, it, it has nothing to do with arriving at goals or synthetic, but in fact uncovering those moments in time uh, where uh, the synthetic process becomes problematic. My book, uh, The Ten Canonical Buildings, which I think is, is, is relevant in this particular case, uh, takes a series of 10 architects and describes buildings uh, that uh, are, as it were, a, a moment in time, I call them cusp buildings, uh, the cusp building being one where there's a possibility of A or a possibility of B. A is a synthetic uh, possibility that leads from that particular building uh, to a structure of ideas. 
and B is a possibility of an analytic condition which leads to the deconstruction uh, of those ideas and produces a, an entirely different result. Um, one of the, the, um, the specific examples I give is uh, Lou Kahn's Adler and DeVore houses, and I'm sorry, uh, I don't have the slides uh, to demonstrate what, what I mean, but in the book, uh, the Adler and DeVore houses are, are, building, are two buildings never built by Kahn. But in those buildings uh, is the seed of two, stra two strategies. One, uh, a, a, as it were, a, a normative strategy, and the other, a strategy of exception. Uh, both are present in, in the project, and uh, unfortunately, as far as I'm concerned, Kahn chose the normative strategy, which led him to the uh, Richards Laboratory in, in Philadelphia, uh, which is a direct outcome of the Adler and DeVore houses, and then on to uh, many of his other works, which to me are all um, norm uh, exercises in uh, the normative. Now, uh, we can say that uh, another question which arises in uh, uh, this context is uh, how do we deal with the difference between a norm uh, and a state of exception? For example, if we look at the idea of surface um, today, uh, surface in uh, 50 years ago might not have been a normative condition. Today, I think it probably is. Uh, there, is there are several reasons uh, for that. Um, first of all, when Siegfried Gideon wrote his book, Space, Time, and Architecture from 19, 1919 to 1939, the norm of modern architecture was space, as opposed to, say, the 19th century idea of architecture. In fact, Mies van der Rohe said that in 1924 that architecture is the will of the epoch translated into space. So space, uh, the translation of an idea of the zeitgeist um, into space was a normative disciplinary activity of modernism. From that point in 1968 to 1972, Robert Venturi in both Complexity and Contradiction and learning from Las Vegas, proposed that uh, space was no longer the normative valence, but the idea of surface was. That is, the decorated shed, uh, which was the meaningful element, and that uh, what was behind it, as, that is, the, the, the generic box or shed, uh, it didn't matter. So that what happened from uh, 19... 49, from Gideon's book to, uh, to Venturi's book, is the movement from a one normative condition in architecture, space, as opposed to uh, the normative condition of surface. So that one could argue that the notion of surface uh, um, is what we are dealing with today. That being said, the question is, how does one create surface in architecture as a state of exception? Uh, and to look at architecture, as many of my colleagues do, and try and make out of space a state of exception has no purchase today. It is no longer any per potency in any cri critical matrix because space is not the issue that the normative conditions of architecture propose. The argument, therefore, is that in one sense, all states of nor normative states become conditions of a zeitgeist, that is, what it is today. And therefore, always states of exception are related in some way and keyed to zeitgeist issues. That is, even when we look at history, uh, whether it's the classical, uh, the Baroque, the neoclassical, etc., there is always a, a condition that... Uh, changes uh, in terms of the time. Uh, if we look at Alberti, for example, he's the first architect uh, that t brings the idea of surface in the Palazzo Rucellai, in the San Andrea in Mantua. Uh, 
whereas Bramante in um, Santa, uh, uh, Santa Maria della Pace brings the first idea of space as void into a, a consideration. These then become normative conditions uh, and then uh, create the uh, situation where the exception, that is the redefinition of architecture as a discipline, uh, becomes important. And if we again we look at the history of architecture, we can see that what Alberti was trying to do is uh, then uh, contravened uh, by Brunelleschi as a state, I mean, Bramante as a state of exception, and then contravened by Palladio as a further uh, state of exception. <laughs> and um, the interesting thing is that we have to be very uh, aware that uh, as time moves, the zeitgeist also transforms. So that what we have to realize is that we have to be not only aware of history and the movement of time, but how those things create uh, the conditions which we would call normative. For example, I, I take Mies van der Rohe, who we could trace his career as a slow transformation from uh, the uh, notions of zeitgeist uh, to the ideas of genius loci, uh, that from uh, the Barcelona Pavilion, which is mainly a zeitgeist project, to the Reeser House, which is mostly a genius loci ar argument, to his much later plinth pro projects, the fact uh, that uh, there is a movement from the piloti, which stands to the ground, where to Mises' columns, which always uh, in his later work stand on a plinth, distinguish between ground and, re and roof, and thus are, in fact, uh, genius loci projects. So that what I'm saying is that we can witness in Mies a moment, uh, an, an evolution, even within his movement from uh, Germany uh, to the United States, from uh, his projects of 1923 uh, to his projects, uh, his later projects like uh, the Staatsgalerie in, in, I mean, the, the, the National Gallery in Berlin, or uh, his uh, projects for uh, IIT, uh, a, a, a different Mies, that is, who considered, uh, number one, that the norms had changed and that therefore the states of exception which he was uh, producing uh, had to change. Um, I believe that Mies is a very good uh, uh, analysis. Use, uh, one can use Mies to analyze this, the most subtle of all of these changes uh, in modern architecture uh, as a, a, state, a state of exception as opposed to Le Corbusier, who stated uh, the normative conditions of architecture in his uh, four compositions and five points, and then proceeded to make demonstrations of those. So that while, that while Le Corbusier set out the normative conditions of a modern architecture in all of his work, and then proceeded to move toward those, Mies was always uh, trying to find a state of exception, uh, and in fact, one can look at Mies as the architect who uh, uses Le Corbusier as a normative uh, counter, uh, counter to produce the state of exception. Now, um, I think that to, ex to achieve a state of exception today, one cannot just take up the project of the, of the zeitgeist, that is, the project of today, whether it be surface or not, because that would be uh, not understanding how disciplinary time acts as a continuum, that is, how disciplinary time moves between Alberti and Mies, or moves from Alberti and Mies. So, in a sense, looking for the idea of exception, uh, it's not merely the idea of surface or something uh, that is in the geist of today, but the evolution of uh, states of exception which define uh, the ebb and flow of what we call architecture. Um, therefore, 
it's not easy to merely go look at Alberti or the architecture of the 16th century as a disciplinary norm, because then we arrive at architects like Leon Creer. Uh, and clearly, we are not suggesting that Creer is a state of exception, uh, as a matter of fact, even though if you looked at his work to produce uh, a classical discourse today uh, could be seen as such, one is saying that it is merely the re-evocation of a, a st uh, of a normative state that has long ago lost its purchase. So that what one is saying is that there is, in addition to the momentary condition of the normative at any one time, there is the moment the the movement in time of of the discipline, uh, which uh, assumes an ebb and flow between normative and states of exception. Um, I believe that uh, we are in a moment in time which I call uh, lateness. And um, that is, while we've witnessed uh, the avant-garde period of modern architecture, let's say from 1919 to 1939, then we witnessed the high period of modern architecture where capital assumed uh, uh, the goals of modernism from, let's say, 1945 to 1968. And then we witnessed uh, from 1968 uh, to 1988 a, a moment in time uh, of postmodernism, which is the critique of, of the high period. Uh, from 1988, to what I consider to be the present, uh, we are in a, another period which is neither postmodern as a critique of modernism, but another uh, uh, sense of, of time, and that is a period of lateness. I'm not going to uh, talk about that tonight, but I've, in the seminar that I've been having uh, with the uh, German department and others, uh, lateness has been a a crucial aspect of, of the dis discipline. What I would argue is that every 25 to 50 years, naturally, states of exception exist that cannot be integrated into the norms of the time, that is, through design. To me, education, that is why you all are here and why I uh, do what I do, is the location and understanding of what constitutes these states of exception. In other words, how, does, how can they be understood? How can they be recognized? And what do they constitute when it comes to architecture? I would argue that uh, studying function, shelter, sustainability, symbolism, meaning, etc., have really nothing to do with this search. While they are part of uh, what we need to produce, they uh, do not lead toward the exception, but the norm. Then you could ask me, and, and this is where my uh, project uh, that I'm going to show you comes in, uh, <clears throat> what would be a state of exception today? Uh, would they relate to the norms of postmodernism? because there are no, no, no new norms uh, that have been crystallized into another discourse. And I would argue that um, I can't answer the question. I know that the project that I'm going to show you, the Santiago project, is uh, different from my earlier work. Uh, it uh, is different in scale. It's different in content. It's different in the sense that it concerns uh, six buildings as opposed to one building, uh, which is a very different uh, relationship to um, architecture. The final thing that uh, I, I want to say is that while we will see uh, in this project a relationship to history, a relationship to site, a relationship to program, all of those things are, are within uh, the project. <clears throat> they understand the history of the place and the history of such projects, but don't rec resurrect these histories, but create them as a field of 
exception. With that in mind, I'm going to show you uh, some pictures of the project as it has evolved. Um, and one has to understand that it was uh, started um, as a competition um, in 1999 <clears throat> um, and is now almost 11 years old. It was a competition at the time against um, Ram Koolhaas, Daniel Liebeskind, uh, Jean Nouvel, Stephen Hall, many notable architects. Uh, it was, there were 10 architects. Uh, it was an important competition. And uh, the way we worked was to understand what might be the strategies and, and, and management of strategies which would lead uh, Danielle and Stephen and Rem uh, and others to the kinds of solutions that they may propose. While we, on the other hand, having realized that uh, all of these avenues will be, f will be full, that is, if we went into the process like that, was to find a way uh, to create out of this project a state of exception. And I would argue that uh, what we produced uh, as an idea um, uh, was a series of analytic gestures, and you will see them in, in the project, uh, that led us to uh, uh, the project that I'm, I'm going to show tonight. Um, this is not a, a perfect uh, example um, because it contains many of the flaws uh, uh, that any project does contain because uh, the purity of an idea is always compromised uh, in the reality of project. So uh, project uh, itself uh, has uh, the anxiety of that compromise between b design and, and other uh, possibilities. Okay, let's um, uh, turn out the lights and we'll look at some pictures. <clears throat> the, um, just to explain uh, about states of exception, uh, the N in our uh, logo is um, a, a situation where we have a palindromic uh, possibility because if you take the other letters, twist them around the end, you, f you f get the French word amnesie, uh, so that you have remembering uh, Eisenman and forgetting amnesie uh, as a palindrome, uh, and that's why the N uh, is always in red to key uh, this notion of remembering and forgetting as a, a dialogue. Um, I want to start with uh, my, my own history lesson um, and uh, to talk about uh, symbolic uh, contexts because we're talking about a, a hillside site uh, that is a symbolic context. And the first uh, really important one that is a series, a sequence of buildings uh, is the Parthenon, uh, 440 BC. Um, and uh, it is served, serves as a model uh, for the organization of several buildings uh, on a symbolic uh, site. The second one um, uh, that I, I always uh, show is the uh, Alhambra in uh, Granada, which is an evolutionary project in an urban context, uh, which spreads from a single palace uh, with a, a central donut uh, out through a complex of spaces. Uh, uh, first, uh, really, um, uh, conceptualized by Charles V in 1527, even though er, its earlier antecedents uh, date from the 9th and 10th century, 
uh, and also from uh, Moorish uh, origins in southern Spain. Uh, and there's another view uh, of uh, the Alhambra as it spreads from uh, its context uh, uh, on a, a green hillside into uh, an urban uh, fabric. The uh, third one that I want to show is, uh, the, and, and these are all involve what I would call states of exception. That is, the, the, the donut of, uh, of Charles V. Here, the state of exception is very clear. Uh, the Campidoglio becomes the first secular uh, monument in Rome. It, it comes after the sack of Rome in 1527. It's by Michelangelo. It's three buildings uh, grouped around a square uh, which are the, the seat uh, of government uh, at, of secular Rome at that time. Uh, it's approached up a, a sequence of stairs uh, here and remains, as it were, uh, a, a very different uh, condition of space as opposed to the uh, piazza and obelisk which, which marked uh, the routes from uh, place to place uh, in uh, Sixtus V's plan for Rome, and it is very different, for example, than the Piazza del Popolo, which has an obelisk in its center uh, and two churches flanking uh, the, the, the Corso uh, in Rome. So for me, the, the, the Campidoglio uh, reflects in, this, in, in an idea, first, of its secularity, and second, in its organization of space uh, an exception at the time. This is a, really the first, what I would consider, a uh, complex of, of urban buildings devoted to a, a secular uh, condition. Here is another state of exception. This is the uh, Philip II's Escorial uh, outside of Madrid in Spain, where uh, in a, a contemporary setting, a, a, a minor city is created with a chapel, a library, um, uh, a palace, uh, all the accoutrements of a small royal city, as it were, uh, in uh, the 16th century, shortly after Michelangelo. That is, as an, as an agglom agglomeration of buildings. And what I'm showing you always is the, the notion of uh, the different agglomeration of buildings as opposed uh, to single buildings because we're dealing with six buildings uh, uh, as a state of exception. Uh, then you have something like the Hofburg in Vienna, which is a series of buildings, uh, the, the uh, Propylaea, the palace, uh, uh, and buildings, again, which uh, take their cue from uh, a, the context of a previous building and, and, and keep adding on to that are generative uh, from a, a single beginning in the, from the 13th century right through uh, to the 20th century. Uh, and then the final agglomeration of buildings uh, that I uh, know and refer to is Richard Meyer's uh, Getty Center. Uh, in 1984 to 1997. And again, uh, <coughs> an agglomeration of, of six separate buildings on a hilltop. And uh, um, the, the first one, let's say, that takes, other than the Siedlungen, like the Weissenhof Siedlung, uh, or the, the Siedlung in Austria, uh, which takes six buildings of differing functions uh, and brings them together in one uh, complex. Um, so uh, we can move from, from the Parthenon uh, to uh, the Getty uh, as a series of differing views of how one brings uh, buildings together. Here is the project uh, that we are, are, are going to look at tonight. It involves uh, six buildings, 
um, a uh, opera house which is under construction, uh, a, uh, a library, an archive, a museum of, uh, of Galician history, another museum next to it, a uh, 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 Kunsthalle, and a research center. Uh, it has a uh, million five hundred thousand square feet under constr uh, under roof, uh, and uh, the cost is about eight hundred million dollars. So it's a, it's a quite a huge project. And when you want to talk about the scale, uh, here is an eleven thousand seat uh, uh, sports hall here, so you can uh, see how big these projects are. Uh, in comparison to this sports hall. Um, again, I was using, uh, or we used uh, prototype spaces uh, to uh, deal with uh, the relation of history uh, to the present, and we used various prototypes to uh, inform what we were doing. This is uh, Wren's uh, library at, at Trinity College in Cambridge, uh, which is a, a, a grand uh, library space, uh, very similar in certain ways to Michelangelo's Laurentian library. And this is the space in our library, which I will show you in uh, a later slide. Uh, here is uh, the uh, Church of Santo Spirito in uh, Florence, uh, another one of my favorite projects because of the play between the white and the gray and uh, the red uh, sandstone floor. And we were trying here to find the possibility of a red sandstone to go with the gray and white of uh, the interior. Uh, th this is a long argument because uh, they all want local stone, uh, and the, the trouble is that there are no red local stones. And so all of the other stones here uh, that you see in this palette are local except for these stones which come from another part of Spain. And of course, uh, this 11 years later is a fight that we are still uh, waging. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, the idea of a state of exception, no one would care about that. Uh, they want local red, and there is no local red. Galicia, and especially Santiago here on the, on the left, is a, a very rainy uh, climate. Uh, it has more uh, cloudy and rainy days than, than, than any other part of, of the Spanish uh, mainland. Uh, it is in the, the high northwest corner, and so that you find arcaded streets. And we therefore uh, used the arcade as a tool for organizing uh, the, the pedestrian uh, caminos in the, in, on the site. Uh, again, uh, and this is the first project that we've ever done which deals with the possibility of using materials uh, similar to what exists in the context, that is the red roof, the red stone tile roof, the gray um, uh, granite, uh, and use them in a different way uh, on the buildings uh, that we're uh, working on. Uh, so it's the first time we ever use stone, but of course we're using stone in a way that's not uh, constructed uh, but uh, as purely a facade element. Um, again, paving patterns, again, that you see in, uh, in, in all over uh, Santiago like this. Uh, we have, in a sense, done the same thing with uh, the plazas in our project. Um, one of the, the, the significant features, because of the rainy climate, uh, there are balconies which overhang uh, glass balconies, projections uh, all over to the town, uh, which is a, a, a feature of the architecture, attempting to catch uh, more natural light in these projections. And we have done the same thing with uh, our facades that 
the, the glass is always uh, projected out in either two layers here, or you'll see in, in the next facade in a series of uh, three layers. So we're always trying to layer the glass out, <coughs> reaching uh, for more daylight. This is one of my favorite uh, slides because uh, on the left is the facade uh, on the, on the, in the city of La Coruña toward uh, the bay. Uh, and again, you see these uh, various multiple uh, variations of glass and facade uh, for, right next to each other, which have an, an, an amazing pattern and patina, let's say, of, of, of a rhythm plus glass. And we tried to duplicate this by creating a, 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 a three-layered glass. So this isn't a curtain wall, but it is glass. And you can see these are the, very, these are the horizontal elements, the, the vertical elements projecting horizontal uh, and projecting horizontal. So there is this play of three levels uh, on the facade of the museum which you'll see uh, when we look at the museum uh, project. Um, this was the uh, model that we produced, uh, and I see it as why I say it's a state of exception. Um, it's the first project that we uh, did where uh, the buildings were, as it were, erupted uh, out of the ground, that is, the, some projection uh, of the surface uh, was in f became, as it were, the surface of uh, the, f the buildings. The, sh the, sh the shape of the buildings, as it were, was provoked by a series of analytic exercises, uh, which this is what we turned in this uh, and this and the, the following drawings. The idea was that this was a mountaintop. We would cut the top off the mountain, create a building uh, uh, inside, and then put the stone uh, back on top of the buildings. Um, and none of the other competitors, all the others did object buildings uh, that looked like buildings. Uh, and we did a project that looked like uh, a, uh, a mountain. And of course, they were always uh, uh, talking about the Magic Mountain and uh, the issues uh, of, of making ground become a building uh, were uh, always in our mind. These are the diagrams that we, we sent uh, with our project to explain what we were doing and why I'm very excited about the Pope coming to Santiago is that this is the year uh, called in, in uh, Galician, uh, in Gallego, uh, Chacabeo, uh, which is the year uh, of St. James's birthday, falling on a Sunday, which happens about, uh, I believe, 10 or 11 times in a century. And uh, this is one of the sacred pilgrimage sites uh, of the Catholic Church, Jerusalem and Rome being the others. And in the year of Jacobeo, uh, there will be 12 million pilgrims that come through uh, to Santiago. To compare that with an average year at the Vatican of 3 million uh, pilgrims, and you see the extent to which uh, this, uh, this small place has become an important uh, condition. So like Michelangelo placing the uh, Campidoglio in a sacred city, we're placing this secular city of culture into uh, a religious context. And so what we did was to say the, the idea of the site plan, the analytic work on the site plan, was to take uh, the, the street plan uh, in, at the scale of, of the city and, and place it, superimpose it on uh, the hillside as the actual street plan itself of the pilgrimage routes. There are five fingers uh, of these routes that come through uh, into the uh, cathedral square, the Obradoro, um, and the, the, the church of Santiago de Compostela. 
The second thing we did was to take those roots and disturb them by the natural topography, that is, to allow the topography to uh, distort those roots and reimpose those distortions onto this to produce this second diagram. And then there is a third diagram which talks about the, the vectors uh, of the so-called ley lines, in other words, how uh, this uh, place was discovered were by Druid, Druidic monks who uh, read uh, the, 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 the world and the stars uh, and produced uh, a, a codex about uh, these uh, religious uh, implications of these lines of force. And we introduced these lines of force as well as the idea of, of Compostela, which is field of stars, uh, which is what led the uh, pilgrims in the 11th century or 12th century uh, to find uh, the, uh, the coffin of Santiago. And of course, one of the issues uh, in uh, understanding that it was the, the coffin of Santiago was the fact that it was decorated uh, with scallop shells. And uh, all uh, important uh, Jewish um, uh, intellectuals uh, at the time of Christ uh, were buried in coffins with uh, scallop shells. And so finding this coffin with the scallop shell, they thought they had found uh, uh, the true uh, brother of Jesus, James. And so uh, we saw the site as a scallop shell imprinted with uh, the ley lines, with the topographic lines, and the religious uh, paths into a complex uh, tapestry uh, of uh, form. And here is the site plan that we produced, um, which um, uh, first of all, you can see uh, the lines of uh, the pilgrimage routes, which continue down the hillside and into the town so that the modern day pilgrims uh, would come uh, through the uh, secular city uh, through to the uh, religious city. Um, here is the uh, archive building, the library building, the opera house, uh, the Kunsthalle Museum, the Museum of Galicia, and the uh, research building. And, and you can see the plazas, the different uh, markings, uh, the different grids and lines which all reflect in, in their different materiality these three and four overlays uh, of these different times of uh, the topographic time, the topological time, uh, the Cartesian time, and the medieval time, all superposed um, onto uh, the project. What is interesting about this project, we never thought they would ever build our landscape like this. Most projects, they don't build the landscape, but for us, the landscape is uh, the whole uh, uh, structure of the project, that the buildings by themselves without the particular landscape uh, is nothing but a series of isolated buildings. So the landscape is being built exactly uh, with all of these uh, different stone markings uh, and colorings uh, and pavings uh, in this uh, construct. So we're very pleased with that uh, as it proceeds today, 11 years after drawing uh, that building or that map. Uh, here you can see uh, another aerial view of the site. Um, whoop, let me go back. The uh, archive building, the library building, and of course, the, these pieces, which are all part of the landscape, are still to be built, which take the buildings back uh, to this dimension here. You can see the paths, the caminos, and the, the t what we call the tails will come uh, out to uh, this extension here, which is the tail extension of the opera house, as you can see it being built here, the uh, research building, 
and the Museum of uh, Galicia. Uh, the four buildings that the Pope will open are the archive, the uh, library, the research building, and this museum. These two buildings uh, will remain under construction for the next two or, or three years uh, until they're complete. Um, there is the uh, archive building up close uh, and uh, with its uh, local stone roof, uh, the Cartesian grids, the uh, medieval grids uh, imposed uh, in, uh, in here with the medieval uh, Camino here and here and uh, the Cartesian grids over the uh, stone. Uh, there is a, a picture of the building uh, as it exists uh, today uh, with uh, groups of tourists coming. Uh, and uh, what is interesting, I want to talk briefly about uh, the two towers. Um, these two towers were designed by John Haydock, one of the five architects and one of my uh, closest and uh, dearest colleagues. And um, John was an ardent Catholic, and uh, he designed these uh, two towers uh, to be built in Santiago, as well as a book of poems dedicated uh, to Santiago de Compostela. Uh, on his deathbed, and, and what happened was John, uh, as he was racked with uh, the cancer that eventually took his life, lost faith in the body of the church. And so he began to design things that were west facades of churches without the body. Hence, these two towers are, as it were, uh, the west facade of a church without a racked body. Um, and on his deathbed, I promised John that we would build these towers. And in fact, this was the first thing we did was to complete these to his drawings and specification. And what I think is, is very potent about this is if you stand just about where this person is here looking uh, toward uh, the town, the two towers frame the actual towers of, of, the, the, of the Cathedral of Santiago. So there is the play between the, the bodiless uh, church of, of the secular city um, and the church itself, which I think is... Uh, an important uh, part of the project. And uh, you can see this is at dusk, the archive building, uh, the entry uh, and the different pavings uh, and uh, different uh, manifestations of, zone, of, of, of stone. This is the key to me to the notion of the state of exception because uh, if we go back to the talk between Mies and Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier set the notion that uh, there was an idea of the horizontal extension of space, that in the Maison Domino there was this idea that modern architecture freed architecture from uh, the bearing wall. Mies, on the other hand, uh, uh, decided that in fact there was no uh, horizontal continuum of space, but that space involved, and especially in the IIT projects, uh, the 50 by 50 house, the Mannheim Museum, uh, the National Gallery in Berlin, was what I would call an umbrella space, that the roof had a series of columns attached to it or attached to its structure, which lands on a plinth, so that there is the difference between the roof and the ground uh, as uh, differentiated from Le Corbusier's space. What we wanted to do here was to show that, in fact, neither roof nor ground were data, but, in fact, were a series of, of soffits and pochets uh, uh, that uh, revealed a condition of space different from uh, the Maison Domino, or uh, the National Gallery. That is a, a condition of, of uh, two surfaces, as it were, um, uh, playing with one another. 
This project uh, and that idea is similar to what we did at the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, where there is a ground surface that undulates uh, and a top surface of the pillars, which is a topological surface very different from uh, the ground surface, and that the pillars only represent the connection between these two different surfaces. So to key this reading, we have the soffit in the, uh, the archive building. This is the first, as it were, Camino that you come to. And we placed a glass floor so that the soffit would be, uh, as it were, mirrored. Uh, and so you would have a sandwich of, of non-datum, uh, that is, because this is certainly not a datum, and this is certainly not one either, that the whole notion was that there was no datum between uh, the horizontal and uh, surfaces of ceiling and floor. And so this is the, the first space that you come to, which takes that as a keyed notion uh, to be continued throughout uh, the process of the space. And here is another piece of that uh, glass floor uh, with the inscriptions of the lines of force that, as it were, go. They're not, all of these lines are not just here in this building, but continue through uh, the four buildings in a row. That is, they continue through laterally as the buildings uh, progress uh, vertically in a, an east-west direction. These lines run uh, north and south. And again, another view of the soffit and these lines which come through and the uh, floor surface of the buildings. Um, and you can see that uh, here there is a wood floor. Uh, the soffits here uh, move the, with the handrails which play with these soffits that bend down. The lighting is always more or less uh, articulating the difference in the, in, in the soffits. And you move from wood uh, to uh, stone as you move the section moves through uh, the building. Our idea was an attempt to bring what is a large scale project down to the individual scale. And of course, you'll see. Uh, round columns uh, with a certain notation and square columns in another notation. So wherever you have a, a 24 meter grid, you have square columns where you have a 12 meter grid, you have a round columns uh, and then thinner square columns on an eight meter grid. So all of these grids not only are marked in the floor and the ceiling, but also by the different uh, structure of columns. Um, so there's, the, these things all follow within an analytical method that uh, continually uncovers itself. Uh, in other words, the, we uh, take it to one level, uh, and you'll see this in the, in the facade of the building. We produce a, a, uh, a wireframe grid in a Rhino or Maya model. We hand this to the working drawings architect he then uh, takes it to another level of detail uh, to, to find the details in the wireframe grid. Then that, that expanded model, uh, because all of this is done through models and, and really not drawing, uh, is then handed to the contractor who develops another model, who hands it to the subcontractor who is responsible either for uh, the structure or the, 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 the glazing on the facade. And you know it's incredible when we see the actual facade, which is done through a model uh, modeled by the subcontractor, it looks very little like the, the, the initial uh, wireframe model that we uh, sent to the, the contractor. So through an evolution of models, uh, the project evolves. It's not through, and, and it evolves through uh, the potential of uh, these modeling devices to uh, produce uh, these kinds of conditions. There's one panel of glass, I can tell you with a, uh, the last time I was there, that has a gasket on the glass frame which twists along a, a three foot or four foot section 
just to finish uh, to be part of uh, a double curved surface of, of glass where all the glass pieces are square, but the, the gaskets uh, take up the twist that's required uh, for setting the glass into the wall. Another uh, shot of, in the archive building. Uh, we go next to the uh, library building. Uh, again, uh, its interior is finished and it's only the, the tail, like these tails out here, which will come, uh, that are being finished right now as we speak. Um, there is the drawing uh, that we first did uh, of the Camino between uh, the archive building and the library. Uh, and there is that uh, same space uh, in its built uh, condition. Uh, the interior of the space, and again, there is this play between these soffits of the building uh, and the section of the space, the, the shelves responding to that uh, kind of soffit. And the soffits in this building sometimes uh, approach uh, 10 meters in depth. Uh, so uh, there's a play not only between the, the soffit uh, and the undulating uh, floor surface, let's say, but also the section between an upper level here uh, down to this level and through here. And the only reference that I can make is through the, the, the uh, carchery uh, sections of Piranesi, which move from a situation of light through a space to an, a, a nether world down below. And what you'll notice is that the facade here is a, is a double layer uh, of, of, of glass, which is no longer curtain wall. And then uh, its echo is over here in another uh, interior uh, curtain wall uh, so that there are a sequence. You never know what the outside is and where the inside is because there are always a sequence of layers uh, from outside um, to inside. And that's now looking up uh, back at this uh, upper level, the bookshelves, uh, the soffits as they step down uh, through the space. Uh, we saw uh, an earlier uh, slide of that before the soffits had been finished. Um, and there is, if you're looking from over here where the upper level is, the interior facade as it reveals itself and then opens to another level of uh, the rare books down below. And again, uh, the spaces here is uh, uh, the other side, another yet another uh, glass surface and another facade on the uh, interior facade uh, on the other side of the space. So there are a series of layers. Not only are they layers running east and west, but as I said, the, the, the ley lines that continue from project to project continue through from the archive building over here through to the uh, library, through to the opera house and the research building. So we're, there is, uh, in one sense, a series of lines, uh, incisions uh, into to solid, and in the other, there is the incision of space uh, as it runs east-west uh, along the Caminos. And uh, here is the uh, other side of that uh, library space that we were, were just looking at. Um, and uh, the interior facade we saw before, the exterior facade, uh, the round columns, the bookshelves. And uh, you can see the density uh, of these layers, and of course there are the square columns, uh, all marking uh, a, a different set of coordinates in the space. Uh, the uh, structure, a very delicate structure between the, 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 the steel, the structural steel 
uh, and the aluminum frames uh, for uh, the glass. Interior, uh, again, looking down now into the rare book space. This is coming across from the gallery, which we saw before, the book shelves in here, and then down into uh, the interior uh, of the uh, rare book room. Um, next, we go uh, past the uh, opera house, which is building here. You can see the, the retaining walls and the, the tail of the opera house here as we move across. So we're going to walk now into the archive building. Uh, and uh, in the background, the, uh, the first museum building. And uh, the uh, double curved facade of the archive building, which we will see on the outside. And uh, this is the baby of all the buildings. And here is the uh, um, museum building. Uh, and you see the, the uh, structure of the steel structure as it steps out, as I told you, in the three layers. Uh, it steps uh, from uh, leaning in across to vertical uh, to leaning out uh, as it twists around the building and twists Tri twists down, uh, around, and from in uh, to out. So there are the three vectors of this facade, uh, which are taken up in each of these uh, panels. And there, there isn't one. Uh, this is talks about how you can iterate uh, pieces. Uh, there's not one piece of glass that is the same uh, in the facade, and it costs no more. Uh, or slightly more than if all the panels of panes of glass uh, were the same because of the, the way one can model and produce uh, the glass. And here you can see the, the uh, Galician stone on the roof, uh, the Cartesian grid, uh, and the um, uh, research building. There's a close-up of the, the steel. Uh, this is the steel to receive the aluminum, and you can see the structural steel uh, behind the facade. Uh, and you can see the different angles uh, as the thing moves around uh, the facade and down. Uh, so all of the, I, lo I look at these drawings, and I look at the, the object themselves, and I say, we didn't do that. Uh, and of course, it's the result of the, of the structure, the, the analytic structure that's in the uh, wireframe model that leads the subcontractor to something like this. Uh, we didn't design this. Uh, we didn't know it was going to look like this. Uh, this is the, the result, I would argue, of uh, a series of, of, of iterations of an initial wireframe model, conceptual wireframe model, passing through the working drawings architect, the constructor, uh, the contractor, and then the actual uh, uh, steel, uh, the, gla the glazing contractor. Uh, there you can see it uh, on the inside. And uh, as the, uh, all of the mechanical equipment is being put in uh, to before the soffits themselves are put on, uh, and, and here you begin to see uh, the framing of the soffits, uh, the framing of the uh, external wall, and the play between the framing of the soffit, uh, the mechanical equipment in the interior facade, and, and the external facade in its multiple layers. You can see them uh, here. One, uh, then the second one, and the third one out here even before in, in the steel as it twists through uh, the object. And of course, this is uh, a view that uh, looks through the, uh, the depth of the structural steel uh, to the external uh, steel frame that will pick up ultimately the aluminum glazing and uh, the, um, the subframe 
uh, for uh, the soffits covering up uh, the mechanical equipment. Um, this is one of the buildings that will be opened in October, and these are slides from uh, several months ago. Now this has all been uh, plastered over. I just uh, these are the latest slides that I have. Um, this is a very interesting um, uh, process and, and project. Uh, this is the exterior of the, uh, the museum building that we were looking at. Uh, and we wanted the roof. Uh, these are all the, the exhausts and ducts and, and chases that appear on any roof. We didn't want these to, to show because we wanted the idea that this was a, a, a stone project that evolved out of the ground. And so we built a, a three meter high, 10 foot high subframe of steel uh, to carry the uh, structure of the roof. So that all of these roof tiles are put on with uh, their uh, three foot by three foot panels uh, with four screws and four grommets, and they're placed individually over uh, the uh, steel uh, subframe so that the waterproof uh, barrier is here. And this is uh, open uh, to allow the water uh, to run through and run down uh, into uh, the facade. The problem we had with this was not so much the installation of, of the tiles, uh, but in fact, the pouring of the concrete, because the traditional uh, slump of the concrete wouldn't hold on, on this uh, surface. And so we had to find a way to get a concrete mix that would be stable uh, and, and, and hold itself at a certain depth, uh, which took quite a bit of time uh, to do. Uh, we hadn't figured on that as a problem, but clearly the pouring of concrete on that uh, surface as a finished roof surface was a problem. Here you can see the worker uh, attaching, uh, uh, placing the uh, individual uh, pieces. And what we liked about this stone was not only its rough textured surface, which reflects the light in a different way, but the variation of color. So that you have not a homogeneous surface, uh, but one that's constantly reflecting the imperfections of the stone uh, plus the way that they are screwed down, which leaves uh, joints, as it were, uh, between uh, the stone to produce that surface. And here you can see what it looks like as it comes over the surface. It's now uh, been fully covered. Uh, all of this stone has fully covered the, the, the metal paneling here. And so it, it, it practically looks like a stone building that is cut out. Here is the foundation again for the Opera House building and back over here, uh, the archive, I mean the library uh, building. And there it is uh, from the air looking over the uh, countryside uh, of uh, Galicia. Um, uh, a very strange insertion into that uh, countryside. Here is another view uh, of the project uh, from the air. Uh, can I have the lights, please? Um, I want to just uh, conclude uh, by saying that what I showed you and what I talked about tonight are two different things. Uh, I would like to make them go together. Uh, it would be nice to think that they do. But clearly, the ideas that I've had tonight may have been uh, bubbling through uh, what I was thinking about 10 years ago. Uh, although uh, the lecture tonight about the difference between design and architecture uh, was only provoked by having to be at Cornell tonight. And uh, I didn't, I, I've been, I gave three seminars uh, so far uh, on different subjects, and I certainly didn't want to repeat the seminars here. So uh, this is uh, uh, a la prima, uh, a lecture uh, that I have thought for tonight. Um, I don't mean to suggest that uh, I know 
the difference between architecture and design. I know intuitively that there's some difference. Um, and uh, this was the first step tonight in trying to articulate uh, those differences for you. I know for me that architecture has always been an analytic process, that is a process that deconstructs uh, something uh, without an a priori goal. And I also know that design uh, always depends upon uh, an a priori goal and moving toward that. Um, and so for me, they are two, co two parts of a, a very different uh, coin. Um, I hope in the uh, coming months uh, to be able to more clearly uh, articulate uh, these kinds of differences, but I appreciate the fact that you allowed me uh, to think in public uh, in front of you tonight. Thank you very much. I guess I went too long since we're going to miss the, the basketball cake. There was, I was supposed to go to a ritual of an ice cream cake for the basketball team. And of course, one of the reasons I'm here is because I'm a, a sports fan and a, I bleed big red. And um, uh, we're going to a hockey game on Friday uh, and probably going to go to the basketball tournament. And I was invited to cut a cake, a victory cake, with the basketball team tonight. but. We're much too late for that, so I apologize uh, to you, Cynthia, for going over my time. Had I known that, I'd have stopped talking and, and gone out and cut cake. But since, <laughs> uh, since we uh, missed that deadline, I will be willing to take comments, questions, or any kind of provocation. Yeah. Um, I guess you're referring to the term architecture. I think I am. What I'm worried about there is that I believe if we change to the idea of design, the discipline of architecture will wither. That was the whole notion, okay? So uh, I'm always worried about architecture losing out to sustainability, to uh, environment, et cetera. Uh, for me, green architecture is a, is a way of taking people who can't do architecture and letting them make a living in this capitalist society. Uh, but um, uh, I've never known a good green building yet. Uh, and I know that's a very unpopular thing to say. Uh, but since I'm here, and it, it doesn't really matter, uh, 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 because I ain't getting, I'm, I ain't getting a, a green building to do. Uh, uh, and and I, they gave a, a lead certificate to Paul Rudolph's A&A building at Yale, and I figure if that's a green building, I can do green buildings. We can call what I'm doing there with those roofs and you know, uh, stone and insulation and all that stuff, you can say that's green. Um, and of course, people will. Uh, I prefer to think not, uh, but anyway. Yeah? What would you say about this? Like, what would you want me to say? They probably are. Okay. Uh, look, uh, I believe that architecture encompasses the urban. I believe it encompasses uh, uh, the land, that is, landscape. I believe it encompasses the interior, all right? Whether uh, bureaucratic necessity has caused these things to fracture apart, but I believe an architect deals with uh, the urban, the, the, uh, a building or groups of building 
are counters in the texture of the urban, always. Uh, I believe that landscape is not added to architecture and interior is not designed after architecture, but that landscape and interior are an integral part of any design. As you can see, I wouldn't have an interior designer working on those buildings, I can tell you that. Nor, and I always work closely with a landscape architect who knows the flora and fauna of, of, of what is necessary in, in any region uh, to deal how to, how to uh, make those forms operate and sustain themselves over time. And, and so landscape architecture to me is a parallel discipline, but is, it is dealing with architecture. It, it requires something like a structural engineer or a mechanical engineer, et cetera, or acoustic engineer or a lighting consultant. All those people are very important. I don't know how to light a, a, a building necessarily. I know the attitude of light that I want, but I don't know how to specify it. I don't know how to calibrate it. Uh, so we have all of these consultants, but they are consultants to doing architecture, right? They are not disciplinary. Uh, lighting is not a discipline. It is a subset of the discipline of architecture, as is interior design. Now, a lot of people bring interior designers in to work on projects. Um, I've, I've never done that because to me, architecture involves uh, both sides of the exterior envelope, the inside and the outside. So uh, I, I, I reject the, the idea that there is a separate discipline. There is a separate process, let's say, but it's not the discipline itself. Yes, sir. It does. Change, yes. It's on first surface. When that kind of change happens, yeah. is it a kind of interior change to the discipline? Is there a kind of autonomy to architecture? Or does that change then the relationship of architecture to other disciplines? Yeah. Like no. these consultants, like clients, mm -hmm. does it change the role of architecture? No, no question that the, what I was suggesting was that the evolutionary disciplinary strategy, that is the norms at any one time, are both a, a moment in time and a continuum over time, all right? So that uh, that continuum over time is not the exception. They are, they are fostered through exception, which then become normative. When they lose their gravitas or purchase as exception, they become new norms, and so, uh, what I'm suggesting is, if, if a student says to me today, I want to attack the idea of space uh, as a normative condition of architecture, I could argue and say, that's already been done. Uh, it's, it's no longer of any value to do that. Why not attack the notion of surface, which seems to be the new normative uh, since uh, 1968? Well, um, uh, clearly, um, I would argue that capital if, is, is one of the dominant exterior conditions, okay? And I would argue that this project of ours would never have gone ahead if it hadn't been the scale of build that it was. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, the Museum of Modern Art, they need to have blockbuster shows. They don't have small shows anymore. They have big shows. Uh, we do big projects now, not little projects, because capital demands this. I have a friend that's doing a city in China of three million people. How do you do a city for three million people? Holy jeepers. I mean, I can't even conceptualize six buildings together. How could I conceptualize three million? So clearly, capital has dictated the change in scale of, of our discipline. And so not only are we moving a, a change from, from uh, space to surface, but a change from small scale to large scale. Now, Jim Sterling once said to me about uh, all of our East Coast architects, they knew how to do the individual house, but they don't know how to do the next scale of building. What they do is take a small scale project and blow it up uh, and pump it up with air to make a larger project. I won't speak about any uh, of my colleagues, but that has been a, a syndrome 
that has plagued American architects, that they don't know how to deal with that intermediate scale. So therefore, the scale of build is also what has changed in the normative conditions of architecture, all right? That, uh, the, the, and therefore, um, how we deal with that uh, has been made problematic by uh, the explosion of global capital. If you look at Mises' work, uh, Mies was dealing with small-scale projects all the time that he was in Europe. When he came to America, where he had to deal with capital uh, in a very different way post-war, the scale of Mises' projects changed. Uh, if you take the 50 by 50 house, it's, it's, it's a beginning, an inter intermediate project between some of the earlier projects, intermediate to the Mannheim Theater and, and the National Gallery in, in Berlin. So you see in Mies the effect of having to deal with not only uh, individual clients, but corporate clients. The minute he has to deal with Seagram, he has to deal with uh, public clients of a different sort, the scale of build. And uh, Mies was, I think, lucky in the sense that his attitude toward building transcended capital. He almost never got trapped by capital. Venturi, on the other hand, for me, was the great accommodator to capital. In other words, if we really want to look at postmodernism, it is an accommodation with the needs of global capital. Uh, and that's why, for me, it is a, is, is a problematic uh, idiom when it comes to a normative di discipline and why there has been the problematic condition of what constitutes the postmodern, what constitutes its being today. And it, it originated as an accommodation uh, with capital. So we, I could have described what I showed you as all of it an accommodation to the changing social and political uh, conditions of, uh, uh, of the, the world that we live in. Uh, yeah, Werner. Uh, could you take uh, Adorno's uh, idea of I would say yes. And, and what would it look like? <laughs> no, no, don't ask me that. First of all, um, uh, you could argue that those buildings in Spain problem, problematize capital uh, in the sense they are excessive. This is the, the poorest region of Spain, right? It, uh, uh, to spend $800 million on a cultural center where there is no culture, secular culture, is a very extraordinary thing. There's no, there's no history of architecture, two museums with no collections, uh, a, a library for a million books when they don't have 100,000 books. I mean, we're asked, we started with 100,000 and the Minister of Culture said, no, we'll have a million books. So um, you, you could argue that it is, in fact, a, a questioning of the relationship of, of built form to capital in the project. Uh, you could, but I didn't say it was. I have no answer to what that would look like. But I'm not an ironic architect. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. There, yeah. Um, do you think the project uh, takes up exception in a kind of like a dialectics, dialectics in that you begin to talk about Corbin and then how Mies comes along and then um, I wonder whether, I mean, you also when you talk about lateness, you begin to talk about it as we, we're also moving in a kind of like car without a steering wheel, so there's like no reference. So there's no canon to be following and no canon to be an exception of. So I wonder like, how is your work really uh, in a moment of exception to contemporary time? Oh. Uh, now you're asking me to give a second lecture. Uh, no, I, 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 I think to give you an easy answer would be the wrong thing to do. What I meant by this idea of lateness is very simple, that I don't believe there are any new norms to find states of exception with. So uh, that all of the norms have existed for the past 20 to 30 years, and uh, there are no new paradigms with which to challenge uh, exceptions. And so uh, we find ourselves in a very strange moment in time, uh, in both as a teacher and as a practicing architect. Um, um, 
I, I don't teach uh, modern architecture. Uh, I, my, my design studios are analytic. I, I give the students uh, no program and no sight and say, here is a, a, a paradigm from the 16th century. What if that paradigm, what would be the equivalent of that paradigm as it operated in the 16th century? What would it be like today? So that they have to discover uh, r analytic relationships between, or analogies between the 16th century and today. In other words, what I would call a, a period of lateness, uh, which I think uh, exists around 1560 to 1580 in Italy, just before the Baroque, in other words, where the new paradigm, the Counter-Reformation, which is fueled by the Counter-Reformation, uh, produces the Baroque, Borromini, Bernini, Guarini, etc. So I give my students projects which exist in time in a similar moment of lateness and say, what would be the corollary today uh, in, in a similar moment in time? That's the only thing that I do. That doesn't mean that they produce buildings of the, of the 16th century. It means that they produce uh, what I, uh, in some way, corollaries. Now, what do those things look like? And uh, we always ask the students, I mean, Werner has asked me, what, what do those look like? Um, I, I haven't a clue. Uh, my students don't either. Uh, so uh, they often don't <laughs> e e involve looking like anything, right? Uh, they look like uh, something that might be considered a state of exception, one would think. Yes? Is it, is it um, right to say your dialogue between the norm, norms and exceptions is a very coherent construct? Oh, don't do that to me. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to get involved in the Popperian argument. Uh, I knew there's a chance that being in Ithaca that uh, that would happen. Um, look, as you know, uh, Colin used to think of me strangely because he saw me as a zeitgeist figure. I mean, I was the incarnate zeitgeist person uh, as opposed to the genius loci, which he was interested in. And of course, Popper's critique of, of historicism and uh, the poverty of historicism and the zeitgeist uh, always landed directly on my head. Uh, so if you're suggesting that if, if there were the ghost in this room, who is always here, uh, would to return, uh, would he find me too much still uh, as a zeitgeist figure? Probably yes. Uh, so therefore, would I be the uh, object of, 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 of Karl Popper as a problem? Probably yes. Uh, because that intermediate stage that I'm talking about, um, as you rightly suggest, could be considered uh, that kind of, uh, of, of argument. I was trying not to make that argument. I was trying to suggest that uh, there is in that project as much genius loci as there is zeitgeist. Um, but um, I don't know if I can sustain that. Uh, I would like to think that the creation of the state of exception that I was talking about was somehow that possibility uh, within my work. Uh, I'm not sure that the, the, the great uh, adjudicator in the sky would think so. So I think your question is appropriate, uh, and I don't want to duck it, but uh, I probably would have to raise my hands and confess that I'm guilty uh, in that sense. Yeah? Uh, I was thinking to myself, how can you refrain? I can't. You have to go. Distinguish the state of exception from, let's say, the avant-garde. I can imagine that you want to make a distinction, but it. The, oh, it's a big distinction. Right, but uh, but my question is actually um, something else, which is uh, in thinking about the avant-garde, I was thinking that the a new kind of a new process of normalization is taking place, which is through the, I guess, through the mediatization of architecture. That one one engages architecture now not through the drawing, which is about analytics and, and about perception, perhaps, or even through building, through experience in the building, and through, 
I guess, engaging the building, um, but actually through images uh, that are proliferated, you know, both mm -hmm. as advertising and, and, and through publication, etc. And so, so I guess how how would one actually, I guess, how do you deal with that aspect, that process of normalization? How do you carve out? Well, I, I think that's a really good um, uh, analysis of, of one of the problems today. How do you carve out uh, away from the, the, the media and that the normalization of architecture that has resulted? Um, um, I, I don't know the answer to that question because I'm also involved in media. I get work because I am a, a creature of the media as well. Uh, I don't get work because I'm a good architect. Uh, I get work because I'm uh, able to sustain media, really. And so I would argue that I'm both a victim and uh, uh, a supplicant uh, to media. Um, and I don't want to create or, 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 or call out that I'm a, a victim because I can't sit here and say I feel victimized. Uh, uh, not at all. Uh, but, of course, the, the kinds of things that I'm talking about and thinking about uh, do fall victim, the, the ideas that I'm talking about do fall victim to media. And, of course, my students, all of them, for example, especially uh, those that are gendered, say, could you teach us how to do Zaha? Uh, we, we, uh, we, we don't want to learn about Palladio or states of exception in the 16th century. Tell us how to do Zaha. And uh, they're victims of the media. And many of my students, they don't want to learn to draw. They don't want to go to the Bronzino drawings. They don't care about drawing. They care about, can, you, can we do Maya and Rhino well enough to get a job with Rem or Zaha, et cetera? And uh, education seems to be almost a, uh, a, a, a sort of halfway house uh, to their, their future. And so very few of my students uh, are really interested in what I'm talking about as architecture. Uh, and I find that a problem. And I think that the, the idea of shifting one of the earliest schools of architecture's name from architecture to a college of design, for me, is intolerable, right? And uh, I find it it's not just a nostalgia. It is in a response to the the global conditions that we find ourselves in, that that need uh, to mediate ourselves through design uh, is taking place at this institution. With that being said, I'm going home. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>